Hi, so I'm going to talk about IPv6 and actually I'm going to talk about IPv6 deployment um, pr principally for high performance computing and high throughput computing starting. Um, I'm going to wear two hats. So I wear my new hat working in central IT services, but I'm going to start off wearing my old hat working, running a grid site, um, one of the grid sites that Duncan talked about. Um, I now work in research IT, but I'm not a network engineer. I'm a physicist by training. I did a degree, PhD, a couple of postdocs, and then I moved into computing, running the grid computing site at Queen Mary. So this is more from the end user point of view. Um, and I'm going to discuss the motivation, why we did it, um, and some of the issues we had with the deployment. So Queen Mary's got about 25,000 students, uh, 4,500 staff. It's got a campus in Mile End in East London. It's got a lot of student accommodation, I think one of the few universities in London uh, to, to do so. Uh, heavily involved in the LHC. Uh, Queen Mary physicists discovered Proxima b, the planet around our nearest star. Um, so it's kind of quite an interesting place to work. So I'm going to talk about a high performance compute cluster. And this is not the neatest diagram, for which I apologize. But what you have is you have a load of compute nodes and a load of storage connected by some high bandwidth internal networking. And this is what we had in 2012. Um, so we had a couple of 40 gigabit switches uh, with multiple links to top of rack switches and then 10 gigabits uh, to servers. And we had about 3,000 cores. And then in the top right of the diagram, you have our world facing nodes. You have the front end nodes through which we get, um, through which you log in, the compute element nodes through which jobs are submitted, the storage element nodes which mediate the data transfers and manage the storage. That's in the grid world, that's X509 authenticated. And then you get things like Grid Engine, which manage the distribution of the jobs to the nodes themselves. Wearing my new hat, the cluster is very, very similar, but we use SSH to log into the cluster and SCP and RSync to transfer data to and from the nodes. We're going to likely to be using Globus at some point in the not too distant future. So many and varied are the pictures of um, the Atlas detector at the CERN. This is one of my favorite, mainly because it's got me in it. Another. <laughs> <laughs> Indeed. Um, it, it is absolutely, and I suspect that Duncan took this picture, actually. Uh, it's vast. It is uh, 44 metres long, 25 metres high. The proton beams collide every 25 nanoseconds. Now, if you're very quick at maths, and remember that light travels at about one foot per nanosecond, you'll realise that the uh, data, the results of the collisions haven't reached the edge of the detector before the next collision occurs. The raw data rate is about a petabyte of data per second, most of which is thrown away in the triggering. Uh, and collect about 100 petabytes of data a year. Queen Mary has a small fraction. And in about 2012, it had one and a half petabytes. It's now got five petabytes of disk storage. Uh, I should say, by the way, that there are multiple copies of the data and there are multiple derived copies of the data and analysis done on it as part of that. As Duncan said, uh, the motivation for IPv6 is that CERN run was running out of IPv6 space and VMs were one of the things they were particularly <coughs> concerned about because if you have a VM, you have two v two. IPs required rather than one. Uh, and also you might have multiple VMs on a machine, they're ephemeral. And even if CERN didn't run out, their collaborators might. Uh, and the other thing was that Queen Mary was capable in 2012 of doing IPv6, and it was one of the few universities 
uh, that in the UK that seems to be able to and enthusiastic about it. And the Grid PP management encouraged an innovation. It didn't matter what the innovation in, was, but they wanted you to advance science, advance um, something. And given that we could do that, that was in some ways low-hanging fruit for me to say, OK, let's do that. As Duncan has said, there are sites throughout the world the sun doesn't set on the Atlas collaboration. Uh, and network transfers are very, very important. There are 19 uh, UK institutes in the Grid PP consortium. And what that means is that I was running one of those 19 institutes, and there are a vast number throughout the world. So that if I broke Queen Mary, that was, it was slightly embarrassing. But uh, actually, people could still get their work done because they could rely on one of the other institutes. They could rely on Lancaster or uh, Royal Holloway or perhaps Brookhaven in the States. And that was really freeing. Um, so in 2001-ish, um, Queen Mary apparently had IPv6 capable routers, and David Pick, who's in the audience here, is one of the people responsible for that. Uh, in 2012, uh, GridPP got some money to upgrade the network performance. Um, and I wanted, I did a lot of talking to the network team because we were kind of running out of bandwidth and we wanted a 10 gig upgrade. And we also bought some new hardware including Perthsonar, and all the UK sites bought exactly the same hardware for Perthsonar, so it was a standard uh, host. And I bought an extra one to do testing of IPv6 and also jumbo frames. Because, remember, I'm a physicist, I'm not a network engineer, so I'm quite brave with things like that. Nobody had told me it might be difficult. Uh, this is why we needed a bit more network bandwidth. In 2012, uh, we managed to saturate our gigabit link. What this graph doesn't show is uh, the other half of a, a, a link, half of a gigabit we're transferring down another link. Um, so, as you can see, we were rather keen on this network up upgrade. And at the bottom is what it's doing now, which is... Um, about 10, 10 gigabits peaks at about uh, 14 or 15, should be able to peak at about 20. Um, but it's sort of starting to look like perhaps the university could do with another um, network upgrade. This, I should say, by the way, is just uh, particle physics traffic. The institutional students watching Facebook and YouTube, uh, that goes over the res college's resilient, college's other link, um, and there's a failover should one of the links uh, fail. But to get the student traffic, or to get this traffic out of the way of everybody else's traffic, the traffic's going down the two links to Janet. So, I'm brave, but I'm not that brave. So the obvious thing to do, uh, having talked to the network team, is start with a new VLAN, which was going to be dual stack uh, and jumbo frames. And what's the first thing you put on it? A network test machine, so I put a Ripe Atlas probe uh, and a Personar host. And then my plan was to slowly deploy um, new nodes. As I got new hardware, or as I upgraded the operating system, I'd deploy um, the machine as dual stack. So there's a picture of our uh, V1 probe, which has sat there since 20. 2012, it was sitting there last week when I last checked. Um, it's absolutely tiny at the top, um, and it sits there and has just worked. I put a V3 probe um, at our uh, institutional HPC centre in Slough in tw uh, a couple of years ago. It has been quite considerably less reliable, unfortunately. Um, but I will talk about that move uh, a little bit later. So we encountered one or two issues along the way. Um, 
One of the things that being a naive, naive physicist I hadn't quite twigged is that IPv6 traffic is routed, as is IPv4, but the routes might be different. And so on at least one occasion, IP traffic went to CERN, the scenic route via New York. Um, I got a complaint from Prague that jumbo frames weren't working on IPv6. And on further examination, discovered that the problem was not that jumbo frames weren't working, it was that traffic from Queen Mary to Prague was going out via the Géant links, but coming back via Virgin Media or something else, and that link wasn't enabled for jumbo frames, so the asymmetric routing. <laughs> um, I, and another problem is if, if there isn't an IPv6 address, uh, uh, sorry, if the, if the if both ends think they can talk IPv6, but IPv6 is broken in the middle. One of my colleagues at Oxford enabled, um, was going to enable his machine, and, and to get uh, these things done quickly, he put in a ticket to their um, help desk system to ask them to add a quad A record. And they were much, much quicker than he'd anticipated. And as a consequence, uh, his, his machine broke. And I, I rang him up to say, uh, your, why is your machine broken? And he said, oh, well, I haven't quite got there yet. They, they beat me to it. Um, and about three years ago, I moved over from uh, particle physics to IT services. And uh, my colleague, Terry, and uh, Dan continued to, to, to roll out IPv6. And although I thought Imperial had got there first, Actually, Queen Mary was the first site to add quad A records for everything. And, you know, a couple of months after, everything broke. Everything broke rather spectacularly. Queen Mary jobs were not working, and there was much consternation. And it eventually transpired there was nothing wrong with Queen Mary. The problem was that some critical machine at CERN thought it could talk IPv6, but couldn't. And, and so that was, uh, that was eventually fixed. But it's one of those, um, those issues that you, you come across. Uh, now, I then moved to IT services. And there's a big institutional HPC cluster. And it was actually housed in the same room as the particle physics cluster in a separate, separate set of racks. But we had air conditioning issues. and power issues and the size of the room was limited. So a decision was taken to move to uh, the JISC shared data center in Slough. Now, all the academics in the audience will know, know about this data center, but essentially JISC have brokered a deal whereby at probably preferential rates and certainly on, a, on, a, on an agreed contract, we can move our stuff there and uh, Janet, there's a Janet presence there. So two years ago, we moved, and network was IPv6 ready. I'd said, you know, when we're putting in all this new stuff, it's got to be dual stack. And the movers came, they shifted it over a weekend, and all of a sudden, everything had an IPv6 address, which came as a little bit of a surprise to me. <laughs> and what I hadn't realized is they turned Slack on. So everything got an IPv6 address. And that was sort of OK, because the firewall was there. But one of the gotchas is that multi-home toast got two IP addresses, which is fine. But they also got two routes, because they were picking up the router advertisements on the internal and the external um, uh, uh, interface. So uh, we've had to turn one of those off. Um, but that, re that is one of the things that really came as a surprise. And I said that was about three years ago. And we've edged towards doing one or two things uh, more in IPv6. But um, so the current status is that grid the 
grid PV cluster, which I used to work on, is 100% dual stack, and Duncan gave me some figures that about 30% of the traffic was going over IPv6. The institutional HPC cluster is 100% IPv6 capable. We've got the quad A records on the hosts, but we haven't quite plucked up the courage to advertise quad A records. Um, and the reason for that, in conclusion, is actually two different risk appetites. In grid PP, I was chief cook, bottle washer, and change manager. And when I wanted to make a change, I worked out, did I think it was going to break things? And if I thought it probably wouldn't, or I thought I could bail myself out, I just went ahead and did it. And if I broke it, well, you know, people might be a little bit unhappy, but, you know, the physicists could still get their work done. Uh, I need to adopt a slightly less cavalier approach now, because if I break the cluster, then academics can't get their work done. They can't do the genomics analysis. They can't uh, discover new planets. And, and so as a result, we've been quite considerably more risk averse in the, in the new cluster. Um, so uh, that's it, I think, from me. Are there any questions for Chris? Other than to put the hats on again for another embarrassing photo. That's a... <laughs> no? Okay, in which case, thank you, Chris. Thank you.